So we are just looking at the sayings of Jesus at the moment. And I'm enjoying it. I don't know if you are, but I'm enjoying it. And what I'm trying to do is share the sayings without doing too much explanation or going off on a tangent. You know, I believe that the best preaching and the best best teaching simply brings out the meaning of the text in the most relevant, poignant and entertaining way uh, with illustrations and everything. But all these illustrations, everything around the preaching and the teaching for me is simply to bring out the simple message in a way that people can can digest that that to me is the ultimate goal of preaching so i'm not trying to be clever i'm not trying to um to find things that aren't in the scriptures or i'm just trying to present you afresh with the red letters in the red letters bibles remember uh, you can buy bibles and uh, the, the 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 words of jesus are written in red the red letter bible so today i've been thinking about what jesus said to deal with the question who is the greatest? Who is the greatest? Who is the greatest in Emmanuel Church today? Who is the greatest among us in Emmanuel Church today? Have you ever thought about that? You might think that's a bad thing to think about. Uh, but who is the greatest amongst us in Emmanuel Church today? Who's the greatest uh, Christian? in Great Britain today, who is the greatest of us? Who is the greatest Christian in Europe? Who is the greatest Christian in the world? Who is the greatest Christian in the world? And you might be thinking, well, that's a funny question. I'm not even sure it's an appropriate question. Well, it's a question that uh, the disciples were asking and Jesus spoke to them about who is the greatest and looking at the sayings of Jesus and the words of seeing uh, words of, uh, of Jesus. This is what I just want us to meditate on today. Who is the greatest among us? Well, before you all start volunteering to put your name forward as the greatest among us, I know none of you would. I know you so well, but um, here is here's some scriptures. Luke 9 verse 46 following. An argument arose among them as to which was the greatest. But Jesus, knowing the reasoning of their hearts, took a child and put him by him by him, his side and said to them, whoever receives this child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives him who sent me for he who is least among all of you is the one who is great. So in this first passage, there is a discussion, a discussion about what makes a great follower of Jesus. And the context was, as the, I think this context, I get Matthew and Luke mixed up uh, with these things, but the, the context was them going out and preaching the gospel and casting out devils and um, and teaching and preaching and and so they were discussing, they were arguing, actually, and arguing, who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? And um, you could you could imagine, I don't know, we could make it up, couldn't we? Um, you could imagine maybe Peter saying, I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. I've walked on water. How many of you have walked on water? And uh, somebody else, Matthew, might say, actually, I'm the greatest. When Jesus doesn't teach. I'm the one doing the teaching. I've got such a teaching gift. I'm so good. I'm so I'm so I'm so great. I'm so great. And then another one might say, no, no, I, I'm I'm great. I'm great because I'm John the beloved. I don't think John would have said this, but John the beloved uh, might say, no, no, Jesus, I'm one of his favorites. I'm one of his favorites because I'm the beloved disciple. So I'm the greatest. In fact, Jesus's closest disciples were uh, Peter, James and John, weren't they? So they might have set club together in the argument. So well, wait a second. We know that whoever's greatest among us is one of us three. She, Peter, James and John. How many of you went on the Mount of Transfiguration? How many of you were in the room when the girl was dead and Jesus threw out everybody but his closest and said, Tilitha Kume and the child arose 
uh, we 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 are the greatest. And then they might even even have argued amongst themselves which was the greatest of the three. And so be interesting to think, wouldn't they? What they what they thought was a a, a the greatest in the kingdom, the greatest uh, um, among them. You know, I've been thinking the last few years about what it is to sort of what, how we view as Christians, great, great Christians. And um, and sometimes I thought that sometimes church history, as, as wonderful as it is, we have to be careful with it, that we don't uh, make people too heroic. Um, you know, you, you, you read these books on the great men or women of God in the past and that they're made so great, so wonderful, that uh, everybody wants to to be like them. And often the people that write about them, especially if the people that write about them uh, knew them around at the time, tend tend to give the best view of them uh, rather than perhaps what they were really like, what they were really like. Now, in the Catholic Church, um, it went so far that they started making Christian saints, making Christian saints, and they still do, they still do. And so the Catholic Church says, who's a great Christian? What have they done? And when they think somebody is such a great Christian, then they call them a saint, they canonize them. So that's a great Christian. And all these saints in the Catholic Church are called great Christians. Um, and, and, And we do that too with the John Wesleys and the Smith Wigglesworths and the Catherine Cole. Well, it depends what background you have. And, you know, I, I think I think of books like my own book, um, Land of Hope and Glory, British Revivals Through the Ages. And we talk about great leaders from the revival times and f- from revival and how God used them. And we do try and and, and be honest with their mistakes and things like that. But I think people sort of have this idea that the greatest Christian is probably famous. Uh, Maybe maybe the greatest Christians um, instinctively, uh, we say the greatest Christians must be the leaders of the biggest churches or the, the, you know, uh, uh, all the people that want to go out and and hear them preach in stadiums or the greatest Christians are well known in the media, the greatest Christians are well known amongst the politicians and and get to sit with the president or get invited to 10 Downing Street with other great Christians or the greatest Christians or the ones that lead denominations or or perhaps or uh, and we get we give them titles they're not just pastor they're senior global pastor and then they suddenly become bishops and then they suddenly become apostles And and so we we think of these people that we call apostles. We think of these people we call bishops from all denominations. Well, they must be great Christians because they've got such a a, a, a powerful title. And so it is, you know, those that are on God Channel, those that uh, that write in the magazines, those that's that we can listen to on Premier Radio, which I think is a great radio station. And so you can you can see how. Without us thinking it through, um, al- al- although we know these scri- this scripture I've just I've just given to you, we know it, but in reality, uh, how, how do we apply it? How do we apply it? Who is um, the greatest? The greatest? And um, going back to this passage, I, I mean, Pastor Richard, right at the beginning. Uh, you may not have been here right at the beginning, right at the beginning, he read from Philippians 2, which is all about the greatest becoming the lowliest. I don't have the scripture here, but I was thinking in the back of my mind. And it's all about Jesus who thought it not something to be grasped and held on to, that he was God, but came in likeness of serv- of a servant uh, and was obedient even to death on the cross. And so here we we find there's this argument. Jesus knows how they're reasoning. He knows their arguments about who's the best. And he says he knows the reasonings of their heart. For there is this desire in all human beings to be great, to be different, to be outstanding, to be lauded, 
to 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 feel that sense that they have a position or or that people around them say that they are they are out outstanding it's it's a natural inclination of the christian heart that that has gone wrong at the fall when adam 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 wanted to be great and that was his problem he wanted to be great he wanted to um be like god and um he tried to he wanted to be great he wanted to rise up you know the story of the devil don't you he wanted to be great he wanted to be great he said i will ascend on god's mountain and he tried to ascend he wanted to be great he wanted position he wanted authority he wanted to be higher than other people and recognized as higher than other people even higher than god and both of them got a good thumping from god and so in in our human hearts that which is in our hearts that desires significance uh, and all human beings made in the image of god do have a desire for significance and that's not wrong that's not wrong a desire for significant to be significant to be to be seen to be significant to to have impact this, this, there's nothing wrong with that that was given to us but what happens in fallen humanity is that we tend to think that being significant means that i have to be better than others i have to be in charge of others i have to be I have to be the greatest, the greatest at whatever I do. And because I, I am the greatest, that means I'm greater, greater than these other people. And because I'm greater than these other people, because I'm more popular than these other people, cleverer than these other people, richer than these other people, more gifted than these other people, because of that, then I'm somebody. That's how it gets all twisted. And I think the disciples were discussing it, Jesus knew the reasoning of their heart and they they wanted to be the number two. They wanted to be Jesus's close associate. It wasn't enough just to be a lot among 12. They wanted to be the favorite, the outstanding one, the significant one. And, and that was sin. And so Jesus took a child. And in those days, you know, children were, you know, um, uh, meant to be seen and not heard. And uh, the disciples understood that that there's nothing less important in society and status than a child because a child isn't isn't hasn't even begun it's even the in those days even the least of an adult uh could tell a child what to do those days are gone but that's the way it used to be and he said for who's least among you like a child is the one who is great OK, now we're talking now. We're, now we're hearing one of these razor sharp words of Jesus. Uh, if you are the least among us. You, you you are the one who is great. So if we're asking ourselves the question, uh, who's the greatest in Emmanuel or who's the greatest Christian in Britain? If we were asking our question and you do understand, I'm sort of doing this tongue in cheek not actually asking that we do this, but who is the great? It's going to be the least. It's going to be the least, the least among us, the least in human reasoning. He who's least among you is going to be the one who is great. And then if you can see here, that was the Luke passage. And in Matthew, we, 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 we have it, uh, it expanded at the time. Disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest? in the kingdom of heaven and calling a child put them in the midst of them and said truly i say to you unless you turn and become like children you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven whoever humbles himself like a child is the greatest in the kingdom of god so we've got that picture that pastor richard read earlier on about uh philippians 2 the greatest jesus who thought, who did not gr decide to grasp on to his greatness, did not grasp on to his greatness. That's the Greek behind it. Did not consider it robbery. Like God did not grasp on and say, I'm not letting go of my position. Some people, once they get a position, you can never get it often. And, and we always used to, I've been taught in the ministry, always be careful in church before you give someone a position and a title. Because... Once you've given it to them, it's very hard to take it away from them. Better that you 
you you give them authority and a function in an area than to give them a title or a position until you are well sure that the, the giving of a title and a position is purely to enhance the success of the person in that area. No, no, no other reason but to enhance uh, that, that and to recognize that. So Jesus did not hold on to his position. In fact, he gave it all up, didn't he? Came to earth and became the he became the least amongst us, became the least amongst us. The son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and be a ransom for many. So he gave his life to those around them. He washed his disciples' feet. They didn't like it. Why? Because that's what the least person does. Peter protested about that. Jesus sorted him out. And so he gave his life and ultimately he gave his life on a cross, um, the lowest that he could become, treated like a criminal, naked on a cross. He served us. And that's that's powerful. And sometimes it can almost sound poetic. And around Easter time, we all go, amen. But hey, Jesus is speaking to his disciples then and he's speaking to us now. And he's saying, saying, you can be great. You can be great. He didn't say this discussion about who is the greatest is inappropriate and I'm not even going to demean myself by discussing with you who is the greatest. No, he said to them, you've got greatness all wrong. You're thinking like the world thinks. You're thinking with fallen hearts and fallen minds and you're thinking with a fallen mindset that is like the devil. You're thinking in a fallen mindset that was like Adam, Adam and the devil when they both wanted to be great at the expense of God. Uh, he said, you, you, you're, think, you're thinking incorrectly. Your mind is wrong and uh, you, you have to totally turn this thing upside down. And let me just reinforce this with my uh, my final scripture. Here we go. And this is similar. Matthew 23, verse 1 to 12. Now, Matthew 23 is very interesting because after we, we read this section, uh, Jesus launches into his woes. Woe to you, Pharisees. Woe to you, Pharisees. Uh, and so he judges the Pharisees, the leaders, just before he then judges the city of Jerusalem and the temple. So Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees, these are the leaders, the leaders, the religious leaders, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses seat. Wow, that's exalted. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do, for they preach, but do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to bear and lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by others, for they make their phylacteries broad. These are the things on their head um, uh, and their fringes long. They love the place of honor. Remember what we're talking about? Greatness, honor uh, at the feet and the best seats in the synagogues. <laughs> I um, I stopped it at Kensington Temple. Nobody was trying. To, nobody was trying to be be rude or anything. But I stopped it because the stewards used to put out um, paper on seats that were reserved for pastors or or guests. You know, um, because it was a full church, you did have to reserve seats, especially if people were on the platform or doing other things. And 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 when we had guests or people coming over from other countries to visit us or teams. They would put out on the reserved uh, seats VIP, VIP, and I, and I said, I said, uh, we're not doing this. We're not. I noticed it a few times, and it didn't like hit me. And then once it just hit me, and I thought, VIP, very important person on the front rows, very important person, very important. VIP. In other words, only very important persons can sit here. All the rest of you lot, you other persons, 
you not as very important persons can sit elsewhere. Now, they didn't they were not saying that they just thought VIP is just what you put on things. So we changed it just to reserved, reserved, you know, instead of VIP. Um, so there you go. But this is this is the point. Uh, they like the greetings in the marketplace, being called rabbi. Ooh, they love titles. But you're not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you're all brothers. And call no man your father on earth, fellow Roman Catholics, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. The greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself got to be humbled and whoever humbles himself will be exalted can you see the background here jesus is using all the great well they weren't christians but they were the, they, they were the jews at the time they were the greatest jews at the time they were the greatest they were the greatest no one could compete with them they were the greatest they sat on moses seat they uh they, they do everything to be seen by others and applauded. What a great person you are. What a great, wonderful thing you are. They have their wonderful religious garments to make a big splash wherever they go. They love the place of honor at the feast where everybody can see them and the best seats. Definitely, they had VIP on their seats, probably probably thrones. I've, been, I've seen in churches and um, certain churches where the pastor and his wife sit on thrones. They literally, literally sit on thrones. Everybody else sits on other things on the planet. They sit on thrones. I mean, I mean, has anybody ever read the New Testament? Uh, uh, in greetings in the marketplace and titles amongst titles. Not, not, a, not a title that's a description, description of a function. I'm okay about that. But titles upon titles, not just um, senior pastor, but global senior apostle, bishop, pastor, etc. You You get the idea. And so these are very simple things. So if we want to be great, you see, whose eyes do we want to be great in? This, this, this is where all this comes to. Who says who's great in the kingdom? Well, if we all have the greatness awards, again, I'm joking. If we have the greatness awards at Emmanuel, um, who's the greatest? And we all voted for who were the greatest. What criteria would we vote for? What 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 would we what would we look for? Well, here it's the total opposite to what you see people voted for for greatness in film awards, in sports sports awards, in politics in getting knighted, although some of them, you know, deserve what they get. I'm not against those things. But in the kingdom of God, it's really what does God think about you? Does God think you're great or growing in greatness? Does God think you're good? You, you might have hundreds and thousands of people thinking you're great, thinking you're a great Christian. Thinking you're, It's especially dangerous if you're like we see with the Pharisees, if you've got a gifting. Or you're, you're, you're a great public worship leader. or You've got some sort of like gifting to make everybody like you and all that sort of stuff. And then you can have the appearance of greatness and no greatness at all. Greatness is a difficult thing to attain. To be a great sportsman is very difficult. To be a great musician is very difficult. To be a great actor or actress is very difficult to be a great entrepreneur is very difficult and to be a great christian is also difficult because it means humility it means service i mean i feel convicted right now just saying those words you know but this is the point jesus's words are meant to convict it means humility service uh, uh, looking using what you have for the benefit of of, of others not lording yourself not trampling over people, not seeking um, political position, whether that's in the church or whatever. It doesn't mean that you hide hide your light under your bushel. It doesn't mean that you don't utilize and maximize your gifting and calling, say in business or education or sport or whatever, to its maximum. But it's it's what's here, and and what's here, and that 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 
humbling, bringing yourself lower to exalt others. Take what you've got to help others. That's greatness. It's a journey. Again, whenever I speak on these sayings of Jesus, I'm always worrying that I'm pit that God Jesus is pitching things so high that people go, oh, at the end of it, I'm just a terrible person. I don't do any of this. Well, Jesus did speak razor sharp words. And if we're not convicted by them, then either our hearts are hard, I'm not communicating this well, or something is, ro is wrong. But it's always about going in the right direction. If we look at our lives, think about what Jesus said, think about what the disciples said about greatness, and realize that greatness is very different in the Father's eyes than it is in the world's eyes and the worldly church's eyes and seek that greatness that comes from above, then not only will we benefit, but everybody around us will benefit. The greatness will be in its blessing of others. Thank you, Pastor Richard. <laughs>